ladies and gentlemen, I'm so grateful uh, to the Smithsonian Institution, to ICOM, to Mellon Foundation, and a number of partners for raising the topic of protection of cultural heritage in armed conflicts. It is our common responsibility to safeguard cultural heritage that represents our nation's identities and has long become an integral part of humankind's legacy. As Ukraine's ambassador Volodymyr Yelchenko stated at the United Nations Security Council briefing on the protection of cultural heritage in armed conflicts, since times of Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Emmer de Vatel, the international community has developed a wide framework of rules and procedures to protect cultural heritage from harm. However, it continues to remain the object of destruction, looting, and trafficking. The aftermath of recent and ongoing conflicts in Europe, Central Asia, Middle East, and Africa are still fresh in our memory, with numerous barbaric acts committed against the civilization itself. Regret regrettably, but the topic of today's discussion is also relevant to the situation in my country, as the objects of its cultural heritage are being destroyed, illicitly looted, excavated, and subsequently trafficked out of Ukraine. Let me provide some deeper insight into the cultural heritage protection in times of conflict in Ukraine. I'd like to present three ongoing cases on Euromaidan protests, annexation of Crimea, and Russia's military intervention in Donbass. It's deeply symbolic that great Nelson Mandela ended his earthly life exactly at the time when Kyiv Euromaidan protests were multiplying their first barricades on the other continent in the heart of Europe. It is as if Ukrainians took up the symbolic light of dignity and rights. Euromaidan uh, began when former Ukrainian President Yanukovych rejected a treaty with the European Union. The peaceful movement protesting the widespread corruption and restriction of human rights and freedoms turned into the project of complete renewal of the state and nation and the system of power and has received a name of the revolution of dignity. Strategically, the country turned its back to the communist past and turned its face towards the civilized countries by launching the decolonization process. In, let me start with Maidan case study. In January 2014, a number of cultural institutions, including the National Art Museum, the Kiev City Museum, the Parliament Library, archives of the National Academy of Sciences, and the large number of ar architectural and historical monuments located in the downtown of Ukraine's capital found themselves at the epicenter of street battles between the riot police and protesters. The cultural heritage, as well as the people, became the hostages of the escalating political standoff. Most cultural properties survived due to DRM strong leadership and capacity. Some, as the Kyiv City Museum, lost a part of its collections looted unexpectedly but by riot police. It is important to note that the Ukrainian Committee of the Blue Shield was founded at that winter on fire as a public response to the crisis. The CBS Ukraine and ICOM Ukraine activists coordinated efforts between museums, libraries, and archive workers, members of public organizations, and volunteers to prevent vandalism and looting, provocations and damage to cultural property in times of mass protests and violence. They managed to stop a chaotic wave of damaging the Soviet-era monuments in Kyiv and help to clean up storage rooms and evacuate the Kyiv City Museum. The cultural activists provided 24-hour monitoring and patrol in the capital's downtown. 
they initiated activity on an expert group to protect cultural property from looting and vandalism at the official presidential residence Mejahiria and transported these artifacts for temporary storage in the National Art Museum. Blue Shield Ukraine was also communicating with its international colleagues, providing them with information on the events and getting advice, expertise, and support. In January 2014, a few museums and NGOs launched a joint project, the Maidan Museum Initiative, to preserve artifacts and stories, displaying in different ways the unprecedented movement for freedom and dignity. Now it's a state-run institution I'm working in, entitled the National Memorial to the Heavenly Hundred Heroes and Revolution of Dignity Museum. It is addressing challenges and possibilities in presenting conflicted history, healing trauma, cultural heritage protection in times of crisis, providing post-conflict dialogue and facilitating national reconciliation. After the revolution of dignity, Ukraine lost its territorial integrity as the Russian Federation annexed Crimea and was engaged in occupation of Ukraine's eastern regions, which were declared by separatist quasi-governments as independent republics in spring of 2014. Over 13,000 people killed in this, in this non-declared hybrid war and over 1.5 million people internally displaced from occupied Donbass and Crimea. Ukraine uh, lost it, all its cultural property on the peninsula, including the ancient city of Tauri Kersones, nicknamed the Ukrainian Pompeii, founded in the fifth century BC, and its Hora in Sevastopol, which was inscribed to the UNESCO World Heritage List one year before the crisis in 2013. This large classical ecology, ecology site on the Black Sea suffers from structural damage due to surrounding modern development. As of January the 1st, 2014, on the Crimean Peninsula, there were 14,000 cultural monuments, 54 museums, 300,000 museum items, six historical and cultural reserves. In a short time, by the end of 2014, a regulatory framework was issued in the Russian Federation, which made it possible to integrate the Crimean cultural heritage in Russia's legal field. 2018 UNESCO's report on the situation in the annexed Crimea notes gross viola violations by the Russian authorities in protecting cultural heritage in Crimea. According to the Ministry of Temporary Occupied Territories, and internally displaced persons in Ukraine, the Russian Federation actively destroys authentic monuments under the guise of conservation work. One of the examples, the Hans Palace in the city of Bakhchisarai, a 16th century monument built with Ottoman and Italian influences that served as the main political, religious, and cultural center of the Crimean Tatar people during the reign of Crimean Hans is reported to be destructed. In fact, instead of the conservation work, this site was simply repaired by a construction team with no experience on cultural sites in a manner that erodes its authenticity and historical value. Its original oak beams and handmade roof tiles were replaced the murals were damaged. This is another example of how the very identity of the Crimean Tatars is being neglected and threatened. The destruction, one more example, the destruction of the Mithridate Steers was also recorded alongside with the fall of the columns in the ancient city of Panticapea, now Kerch, as well as the collapse of part of the walled of the southern gate of the Yeni Kale fortress because of the intensive car traffic over the newly constructed Kerch Bridge from Russia. Despite the rules of international law, 
unsanctioned archaeological excavations were carried out on the peninsula, and artifacts were exported out from its territory to Russia and black markets. From 2014 to 2018, the Ministry of Culture of Russian Federation issued more than 90 permits for archaeological excavations. More than a million artifacts were excavated during the construction of the Kerch Bridge connecting the peninsula with Russia. Crimean Tatars burial grounds and over 90 historical sites were demolished to construct the Tavrida Highway, which leads to this bridge. Black archaeologists are a major threat to the monuments there. For example, in December 2018, the FSB Federal Security Service of the Russian Federation branch in Crimea, preventing the illicit circulation of cultural property, seized and handed over to the Central Museum of Tauris a collection of 200 artifacts valued at $2 billion. Crimean artifacts and Ukrainian museum collections have been transferred to Russia to be showcased at numerous exhibitions celebrating Russia's own cultural heritage. For example, in 2016, the Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow opened the Ivazovsky exhibition, which included 38 artworks from Ivazovsky Museum in the Crimean town of Feodosia. The ongoing case of the disputed Crimean skis and gold artifacts is an interesting example and well known as well. The exhibition, The Crimea Gold and Secrets of the Black Sea, went on view at the Allard Pearson Museum in February, when Crimea was still a part of Ukraine. The Dutch Museum was lent over 500 pieces from four Crimean museums and 19 pieces from a Kiev Museum for, the ex for this exhibition. The dispute between Ukraine and Russia, where the collection should be returned, has begun after the annexation of Peninsula. In December 2016, the District Court of Amsterdam ruled that all the exhibits should be transferred in Ukraine, to Ukraine, as only sovereign states can claim cultural heritage. And the annexation of the Crimea to Russia had been declared illegal by the United Nations and other international bodies. Ukrainian authorities welcomed the decision, but the Crimean museums soon filed an appeal. So the Amsterdam Court of Appeal postponed the delivery of the verdict in the case of return of exhibits from Crimea. All the situation prompted Ukraine to approach joining the second protocol of the Hague Convention. The bill on this was submitted by Ukraine's president to parliament this month on February. The military conflict in eastern Ukraine since spring 2014 is another vivid case of major threats to cultural institutions and heritage sites and people there. Six years of severe military battles resulted in considerable loss of human lives and cultural heritage, intensive refugee and humanitarian crisis. The mostly affected by military actions bombarding, taking military position, making trenches, etc., are historical monuments, museums, cultural sites, centers, and architectural, uh, archaeological sites. But states are not the only perpetrators of crimes related to the cultural property. There is a growing trend when such offenses are committed by non-state actors, including criminal, armed, and terrorist groups. They target the objects of cultural heritage and attempt to rewrite history. Erase whole chapters from the collective memory of people and regions. One more example, uh, the Center for Contemporary Art and Platform for Cultural Initiatives, Isolatia, housed on the territory of the former Ansolation Material Factory in Donetsk, was captured, robbed, and undermined by pro-Russian separatists. They organized a prison there and tortured people. The Donetsk Museum of the World War II was also attacked by militants with the aim of appropriation of, of weapons and military equipment 
for their further use against the Ukrainian armed forces. The militants of the self-declared states of DNR and LNR hijacked a number of tanks from historical monuments. There is a broad range of museums, archaeological sites, and monuments which are in the, in the, in the epicenter of military conflict. One of them, Savur Mogila, the Second World War Memorial Obelisk collapsed after enduring weeks of heavy shelling. Another example, the building of the Luhansk Local Law Museum was also damaged in artillery fire. Currently, Ukraine has no access to the occupied territory and information in order to make a damage assessment. Before the occupation of the eastern regions, the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture officials visited the endangered museums and sites and advised their dire directors and teams to close exhibitions, to take safety precautions, and enact emergency planning. The ministry also informed the regional state administrations on urgent measures for preservation of cultural property, strengthening protection of cultural heritage, worked out recommendations on priority measures for preserving collections and preparing for evacuations. The Donetsk uh, law, local law museum ignored the recommendations. And in August 2014, its 30 galleries were damaged by shelling, eight shells, and most collections were reported to be lost. So what has been done? In 2014, a working group of museum experts was formed on a voluntary base at the Ministry of Culture. As a member of this working museum rescue group, I must admit that we had not enough knowledge, experience, and resources to provide our mission systematically and skillfully enough. We looked forward to any opportunity in developing our individual and institutional capacities in the United Emergency Preparedness and Response efforts on local and national levels creating a networks of experts and volunteers and getting support from our foreign partners. This great help was provided by international institutions and colleagues. First aid to cultural heritage, training courses, workshops, consultations, discussions, and conferences organized by ICROM, Smithsonian Institution, Prince Klaus Hunt, and supported by many partners in Italy, Netherlands, United States, Moldova, Ukraine, including U.S. Embassy in Ukraine and Fulbright program, helped us obtain broader knowledge on various aspects of disaster risk management to work out strategies and plans to reduce, to reduce risks of damage to cultural heritage. A number of workshops based on ICROM methodology was held in Ukraine since then. So, concluding, I'd like to stress that it happened that international legal regulation of protection and restitution of cultural property have proved to be ineffective in protecting the occupied cultural wells in Crimea and areas of armed conflict in Donetsk and Luhansk regions, as the concept of internationalized conflict is not enshrined in no international treaty with international humanitarian law. Such qualifications will be exclusive doctrinal and will not add any additional mean of protection artifacts on the occupied and annexed territories. Thus, in order to be effective, much more actively should be done the following things. St stress on the responsibility of states for the protection of cultural heritage, according to international laws. Creation of inventories of cultural property and other items of historical, cultural, and religious importance, which have been illegally transferred from armed conflict areas, notably, notably from territories under foreign occupation. Encourage efforts of all jurisdictions, national and international, and call for a close cooperation of law enforcement and customs agencies in investigations, prosecutions, seizure, and confiscation, as well as the return, restitution, or rep repatriation of traf trafficked cultural property. Proactively cooperate in cultural heritage crime cases, liaising with auction houses and museums to track down objects originating from war-affected areas 
and to prevent the exhibition of artifacts from occupied territories. Learn more and exchange international experience in cultural heritage protection and provide systematic consultations with foreign partners and training courses in cultural emergency response. In conclusion, I would like to stress that in the last seven years, Ukrainian cultural heritage was severely endangered by mass protests and accessions of its territory and military conflict in eastern occupied regions. This particular moment in time displays a critical need for Ukrainian cultural heritage professionals and activists to gain new skills in empowering and inspiring governmental and local leaderships to exchange knowledge and experience with the international colleagues. Why is this important? As Corin Wagner once stated, the choice is ours. If we continue to act as individuals and function within a variety of discrete organizations, we will almost certainly fail the next time colleagues in a war-torn country need us. However, if we unite, we can make our voices heard and perhaps even be influential enough to prevent the next time. Thank you for your intention. <laughs>